Okay. okay. So on the mandible, you're going to have the same thing. If you've got undercuts back here, a lot of you guys have undercuts in the retromyelohyoid hyoid area. So you want to block those out first. If you have tori, uh, especially large ones, I saw someone in this lab had a large one. You want to tuck that wax up underneath there. Okay. I don't really have that issue here. So we can help you. Um, chair side here if you need help with block out. Just remember, less is more when it comes to block out as long as it is adequate. Okay, so again, I'm going to cut my two squares. I'm going to place it over the teeth. Now you don't need to cut your, you're going to do an additional layer over all of this, so we don't want to cut our stops until after we have all the wax that we're going to use on the cast, otherwise you're just going to cut it twice. Okay. So again, I just want this over the teeth, so I'm going to heat this, come in, get really close to the gingival margin. The more you do this, the easier it will be, I promise. You will not fight wax the rest of your life. Maybe for the rest of this semester, but... And there are different ways to do this. Some people would put the, the whole layer on first and then come back and just add it over the teeth. You'll find that the more faculty you encounter while you're here, we all have our own ways of doing things. Doesn't mean they're wrong. Um, just what, what works well for us. And you'll find what works well for you. It's the concept that you need to understand. That. And so when you make, Essentially what you all are making today is a custom tray. Um, you're making a combination. You're making a custom tray for what it would look like if it were fixed, but it has longer extensions. It has the extensions to in order to gain the vestibule. So I don't know if you all saw that, but I my wax is a little bit short. So I heated one side almost to completion and then flipped it over. I'm running the wax through the blade, not my fingers. So here I'm going to position it where the retromolar pad should be. And then I'm just going to gently roll it all over. Okay, You can see how this goes up and over the retromolar pad if it's there. And I want to keep it there. And I usually tend to really adapt my wax at the land area. That's where I put the most pressure. Because then I have a visual of where I'm cutting back to. kind of can know how high up to come. Heat this guy up. I'm pretty happy with this. It tore a little bit right here. I'm going to fold this wax in on itself. Yeah, these are little little things that you'll develop in techniques and ways that work well for you again as you go along. You all can see if that wax is heated well enough I can just peel it right away from the existing wax. It just makes it easy. And one of the reasons I get, I worked really hard at learning how to eyeball where I want my periphery to be rather than measuring it is because I'm eyeballing when I'm cutting back. And as you do it, you'll, you just, it just practices what you need in order to be efficient at it. But the more you do it, the more you'll know where your lines are underneath there. Some people use Sharpies so that they can really see it through the wax. I don't like to do that because I think that it's um, it, it makes the tray look disgusting, to be honest. It, the black marks get in it and the patients look at the tray like, what are you about to put in my mouth? So where I over trimmed a little bit, I'm just coming back with these two smaller pieces and adding it. Now I, I doubled that one over so I really squeezed it to thin it out. Okay, I'm going to heat it, blend them together. <laughs> Not burning myself. All right. So now I have these references to cut my stops. 
warm up my knife really well. Kind of line it up with those lines there. And again, this doesn't have to be pretty, you know, it doesn't have to be the whole molar or exactly over the molar. It just has to have surface area to contact, okay? So you can see I'm more on the distal half, um, distal two thirds of that tooth. I'm happy with that, okay? I'm gonna come up and do the same thing. And you can reheat your blade as many times as you need to to make this effective. Okay. And I just trim this to the level of the top of the teeth. Okay, you don't need to go over or under the teeth. If you wrap it over the incisors, it's gonna break when you try to take it off and it's gonna have interferences. So you just want it to be flush. Let me show that in the camera there. Should have. So it's just flat with the top of the incisors, okay? Do the stop on the other side and then I'll throw a tray handle on a tray for you real quick. I'll probably just do the edentulous one um, outside of class time so you all can work and it'll post it so you have it for future reference for next semester. All right, so I've got my wax on here. I almost wanted to put this on before this. This is not my friend. This is my friend. I'll put this on first. You can pay labs to make these for you. Um, I will tell you that lab work, um, when you get good at it, uh, or when you get efficient at it, I should say, it doesn't take you that long. Um, I think the lab that I use for a denture charges about 150 bucks for two custom trays. So if you, that doesn't include the setup fee and the processing fee and the wax rim fee. So if your denture fee is not pretty high, if you're paying the lab technician to do all this, you're not going to be making much money. Um, some people think that time is more money. To me, that is a very, very true statement. Um, but when it's stuff like this that I know how to manage and it doesn't take me very long, I would rather do this on my own patients. Um, I worked as a hygienist for five years. I think I told you all as a hygienist. Here's my Vaseline. Um, and in my the practice that I was in, um, our doc trained one of our Eddas to make custom trays and she just paid her um, her regular uh, wage to stay after an hour a day and work on it. And so she actually ended up saving a bunch of money in lab fees by training her assistant herself and having her do it. So it's really good that you all get exposure to this. You have the option to do it. So you can see my stops are really well exposed. I'll, sometimes on these stop areas, I'll actually do it until the um, material breaks through so I know that I'm gonna get contact with the teeth. And that's especially if I'm doing it for fix, but I can feel the cusp tips there, so I'm happy with that. On the mandible, remember I said I like to leave this on the little paper so I don't get stuff on it. On the mandible, I like to go ahead and look at my arch and see how wide it is. This is not going to be big enough, but I, I don't want to have to tear it and stretch it, so I'll cut out the middle area initially by itself and then lay this over to get me started. What I like to do is do everything either on the front or the back so that I only have to add to one side. If I center this and I push it down, I'm going to be short, buckle, and lingual. If I start it so that I'm, I'm at, at least full length on one side, then I only have to add to one area. Does that make sense? Just save, just work smarter, not harder. Okay, so here I got everything that I need except for right in this area here. And I have a pretty straight area to come back and repair to on the back side. Okay, this will fit perfectly here. Again, water is really good to help you blend these areas together.
Some people trim at the very end. Some people trim as they go. I obviously trim as I go. I like to know how much excess I have over here because if I'm doing this in my practice and I'm paying $17 a sheet, that's probably not quite that much, but it's probably at least 12. Then I don't want to waste it. So if I don't have to open a new pack, I won't. Sometimes you'll get all of your tray done and you just don't have enough for one handle. And if you would trimmed a little bit more, you might have it. So I'm a little bit short on this retromolar pad. That's something I usually don't like to do. I like to cover that for sure in the beginning. Not really an area I want repaired. I don't want the distal extension of this tray to be added on. But for sake of completion, I'm going to go ahead and add it. Ideally, I would have covered that with that initial piece. And it's a little bit longer than the actual retromolar pad right now. That's okay. When I cure it, I can come back and trim it off. Okay. I don't know if that piece I saved is going to be enough for us. Nope, but I'm going to use it. I'm going to use it for the tray handle. So you all are probably going to need three or four sheets total. If you run out, um, you can ask for more from the window. Again, trimming it about the height that I need it. Maybe a little bit thicker just because I'm going to have to really get it down in here. And I've got some excess, so I'm going to intentionally push that excess back there because I've got more than I need. I can roll it onto itself and make it thick enough. I'll come back and trim away what I don't want. And the nice thing about when your fingers... Sorry, Dr. Pearson, I just put my head right in your way, didn't I? <laughs> Y'all wanted to see the back of my head. When your fingertips are wet, they will, it won't pull this as much off the cast. Right now, as I push on it, it kind of bounces back a little bit. So make sure that you have a little cup, Dixie cup or something of water next to you. So save some time, get you all going. I'm not going to blend all those areas. On the mandible, you're going to want a little bit more than you had on the maxilla for your handle because your handle is going to extend all the way out. I'm going to put this back in here and use it for my edentulous tray here in a bit. So I roll this like a three-year-old does Play-Doh. And then I just lay it over the top of the tray. Okay. So again, you'll use as much as you need to use to be able to get a hold of it. But you want it to be about in the center. And you want to extend it back so that these thin areas, now th it, these trays are not as thin with teeth. So with a, with, with, if I was doing this for an actual tooth, I would probably build a handle that came up and out in that L shape like that on the outside, okay? But because we're doing this to learn about removable, I don't want these interfering with your border molding. And you guys are going to use these trays to border mold on each other. So we need to not have the handles there. But if you're doing it for dentate reasons and you're not worried about border molding, then you can just get rid of all of this excess because you've got thickness of your tray and your tray handle can go wherever you want. But again, a wet finger, blend it in. Some people will kind of cut a groove in this back here. I like to cure it and then take a burr and just create like a little channel right here so I can grab a hold of it. Um, but as long as you've got some height there, in an area to grab onto, that's what really matters. So it should look something like that, cleaned up, and then you can cure it. All right, any questions specific from this lab? All right, have fun.
Cut. 